And good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to another live Xanadu Gallery online critique group session. Today is uh, Wednesday, February 24th, 2022. Uh, good to be back here with you on a Wednesday morning to have the opportunity to uh, look at a fellow artist's artwork um, be able to talk about that work um, and get to know the artist a bit. Um, and so today I'd like to welcome our featured artist, Julia, and help me with the last name, Julia Vienstra. 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 There we go. Excellent. Well, it's great to have you here. And you're joining us from north of the Canadian U.S. border. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, where your studio is located. Um, and then give us a little bit of an introduction and background about how you came to be an artist. So my name's Julia, and I live in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, I had a gallery in my city for about nine years. Mostly it, it was my own gallery, just my own stuff, like so a studio slash gallery. And when COVID hit, um, I took the uh, opportunity to renovate an outbuilding on my property. I live on the lake, in Lake Ontario in Hamilton and I renovated a building there. So now I'm, that's where I am now in uh, just walk, padding out from my house with my coffee. It's absolutely wonderful. And um, I've been an artist my entire life. So I was one of those kiddos that got identified in grade three. My, you know, my mom was told, you know, she can draw and my mom was an artist and many of my family. So it, she was like, sure. <laughs> great and um, I took illustration in college and then I went on to work at a book publishing house but I honestly have to tell you I am the worst employee in the entire world never wanted to have a nine to five can't do it and um, I took a really good excuse so I had five kids so that I didn't have to go into work and <laughs> I don't know that seems like uh, that might not have been a way to avoid work uh, you might have brought a little more work on yourself <laughs> yeah but it's such a creative venture right and um so then I did mostly paint when I had commissions so um I painted to earn money I didn't have a lot of time obviously when the kids were little um to just explore and paint but um, when my children were in between the ages of eight and 15, we moved to Tanzania, Tanzania, Africa, where we lived for four years. Um, then we moved to Kenya for a year and then returned to Hamilton. I did spend, we did spend a little bit of time in Virginia Beach in New York um, in between, uh, before Africa. So I was able to, um, in Tanzania, it sounds interesting, but I was able to set up a studio there because I had a little bit more um, time. My children went to an international school and so I had more time to, to paint. And when I came back to Canada, I had been purely figurative. So you can imagine that Africa gave me so much fodder for painting. It was incredible. And my work was very well received there by the expat pit expat community and, and things like that. When I got back to Canada, um, to be honest, I didn't find white people as interesting to paint anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I had been in this dry, dusty land for five years. And all of a sudden getting back to Canada where my four, the four seasons were so intense, it was a logical switch to landscape, which is what you see now. And um, I'm in about six to seven galleries across the country. And um, I sell well, and I have a, a print line, but um, I've never ventured into the States yet, which is when I started uh, subscribing to Jason's emails. You know, he just got me so interested that I thought, well, here's a question I have. So yeah, I, I applied for this critique. And so here we are, and I think that's a great segue to um, shift over and look at your work. And um, Julia, if we can, maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, you talked about that transition from figurative work um, into the landscape. As you made that transition, was there a, um, a, a concurrent transition in terms of style and color and texture um, or 
has we're just looking at the landscapes would would we see some consistency between the the previous figurative work as you came over to the landscape work absolutely so um definitely you would be able to see my fingerprint um in my uh landscape in my figurative I, i'm a very colorful painter that was one of the critiques that i had um in in art school is that i was you know too colorful which i'm glad i didn't listen to because now that is my trademark and uh the the style definitely has evolved as everybody's should and would over 20 years but definitely um you'd be able to see that finger mark of mine in my in my figurative and somebody just asked yes this is in inches and canadian dollars so deal man <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, quite quite a bargain. Um, and and so talk about um, you know as you transition into landscapes, um, are you um, spending time out um, painting plein air, photographing your subject matter, um, working in the studio? What's your process? Your creative process? So I get most of my reference uh, through photography. And so when we're out and about or driving, I'm the worst for my, my husband now realizes that if I say stop the car, turn around, that that's the money shot. He has to turn around because I need that shot. And um, he turns around and he catches the, uh, he allows me to take lots of photos, but I am not a plein air painter. I have done plein air. I think it would be fun. Um, but I, I'm not, I tend to take my photos. I have them printed large. I have drawers full of them and I paint from there. And um, in terms of, and, uh, actually, I don't want to ask that question because we're going to discuss some of the questions that, that you brought up, but just talk a little bit more maybe about um, what it is that you're trying to capture and depict and share in your work. What interests you in the, the, the particular landscapes that you're selecting? So, my one of my um, mission statements is like to capture a moment in time that brings comfort and joy and peace to people where people's like I've been there. Um, I've often been accused of uh, there of taking psychedelics when I was younger and that it's coming out now in my in my paintings. <laughs> but I try to catch the feeling but it really is about it, it doesn't really matter what the subject matter is I don't think it's it's the expression of the paint and using the paint and the techniques that I find fascinating like I could paint the same tree photo 15 to 20 or even more times and still find joy in the expression of the strokes and the design and composition. So I'm trying to uh, hmm, bring across that, just capture that emotion that I'm feeling when I see a, a something. And we're gonna take a few reactions um, to your work and, and then I want uh, some that were submitted prior and then I wanna get some feedback from the group that we have here um, I do want to just quickly look at presentation. And I think as we're looking at presentation, we also have to talk a little bit about scale of work. Um, clearly, you're not afraid to work large. Um, talk about kind of your, your thought process, when it, process was, as it comes to um, the, the scope and scale of work that you're, you're producing. So interestingly, um, you can see behind me, I have like some little ones and then I have some medium sized canvas. And then on this side, it's getting into the bigger size. I have found in my um, practice that I either sell small or I sell very large. Um, my medium paintings hang around for a while and um, I tend to use those a little bit as um we're from a big family, so there's lots of weddings. So I give those things away. I donate those to auctions and things like that. Um, there is sometimes a call for my medium size, but th the large is what seems to capture people, um, which is great because I find just it's just the same amount of effort to paint a large one as it is to paint a medium sized one. And I love being able to um, step up in brush size and stroke 
and capture uh, a little bit of design element in that. Yeah. And so now we can get to some of the reactions to the work. I, I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, so Carol, who is from British Columbia says, love the movement, so vibrant and alive. Chris says, my first thought was if this lady painted a century ago, there would have been a gathering of Canadian artists known as the group of eight. Um, oh, nice. And, <laughs> I really like the colors, theme, composition, scope, and would have, have one of these hanging in my house in a heartbeat, which I think um, we can all agree is, is the highest form of, of compliment that we can get. But, but Julia, respond to that uh, idea a little bit, because of course, as I was looking at your work, um, Group of Seven popped into my mind as well. Um, you know, talk a little bit about uh, maybe where it, has that influenced your work and, and your vision for your work? Um, you, you know, yeah, let me yeah. let you go. Yeah, so have, um, I'm speaking, I think mostly to Americans, have, has <sighs> most, and I, can, and I don't have a screen view anymore, but have most of your, pe the people here heard of the group of seven? In yeah, Canada. let me uh, let me put us out to the uh, the group. I would suspect, and maybe now that I've got you all out here, if you've heard of the group of seven, give us a nod or a thumbs up or a, a yes. Okay, so a good number of us have. So that's worth everybody. If you take anything from today, go and check out the group of seven. Especially Steve Martin, he loves Lauren Harris, and he's been touting. Uh, Lauren Harris works all across America. So it's kind of a neat thing. But as a Canadian, you are raised on the group of seven. Um, it is something you learn in school. It's history. It's everything. And Emily Carr was not part of the group of seven, but she's a, a West Coast artist that was very famous, should have been in the group of seven, but um, wasn't. So I think highly, I remember when I was 28 years old, standing in front of my first Tom Thompson group of seven painting and realizing that this guy was 28 when he painted this painting and being absolutely floored. And I think it was had such a strong impact that yes, like I can go to Toronto where they have a permanent collection and stand in front of the same painting for hours and hours trying to decipher how that artist did it. So yes, I think I've been definitely influenced. That compliment is one of the highest compliments to me that people see a bit of the group of seven, but I'm thinking I'm more contemporary. Um, I've been told that I'm a happy Emily Carr. Emily Carr was a quite a dark <laughs> painter. <laughs> so um, it is wonderful to hear that uh, people right away get that sense in my landscapes. Yes, and um, it, it, it's interesting, and, and we're gonna talk a little bit um, about your subject matter and, and regionality of the work. And, and I would say that um, my first response as I was looking through your work um, was the, the subject matter itself might not have told me, hey, we're in Canada, but your approach and your style to me allows it to really feel and speak of a Canadian um, subject um, or, or approach to style or, or depiction of that work. And, and so um, it, it is just, it, and yet um, you, you do have your yeah. own voice there. Oh, it's hold on, I've got a little background noise. Um, that, that um, you know, this is kind of the interesting interplay, right? When there is this strong influence and you're creating from a subject matter that was used by a very famous group of artists how do you um, depict your or, or do your work in a way that um, maybe can reflect that, but still be your work and, and be unique to you? Well, I find that um, because people connect at that level, I find that most collectors may not be uh, extremely well-versed in why they like a piece. And for me, the fact that they gel with my um, subject matter and my style means that I sell really well because they feel educated on it already. It's a connection. It's something that they grew up with. So it feels like home, which is part of my mission statement, right? So um, I find that it, it allows me to have, uh, to sell well, but it also allows me, yeah, to be uniquely Canadian, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's almost as if within the style, you have a little bit of a shorthand to already make a connection with, with the viewer. Yeah. Um, 
Let me go ahead and open up to our group here for some of your reaction to the work. Um, and, and as usual, I, we, we like to ask, um, you know, as we're looking at the reaction, does the work feel consistent? Is it clear that, um, you know, there, there is a, uh, a common thread running through this work that tells us that it's all been done by um, a, a singular artist? Um, and, and, and how do you respond as you see the work? What, what uh, does it evoke in you? And so if you want to hop in with your comments and response to the work, click on the hand icon or throw your hand up in front of the camera. And I'd love to get your reactions to, to Julia's paintings and to the background that she shared. Uh, Melanie, let me go to you. Melanie Warzinski. Here we go. Um, well, I absolutely love your work. Um, it is just so fun. I just feel like I could step into it and just be in a happy place. The colors are amazing. I love your compositions. But I do have a question. In your, uh, when you're on the screen, your background, it looks like all your canvases are a reddish tone. Mm -hmm. And yep, so I, do you start with red? I do. I like to get rid of the white. Um, I always say that the white is scary when you put up a big white new new piece, the white is scary and you're afraid of it. So I loosely paint red. I don't even do it with a consistent stroke, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And then I can attack that. And if you look, if you were in front of my paintings, you'd be able to see lots of that red showing through. And um, that means I don't have to worry about every section, every centimeter or inch um, being completely covered. And I find when I varnish at the end, the red simply glows and unifies. And what's interesting is I don't tend to have red on my palette. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to go more towards the oranges. Sometimes I do have red, but a lot of my paintings don't even have red um, on the palette. That's but it's a compliment. It's definitely a compliment to the colors that I use. Okay, yeah. thank you. Excellent. That's, Great that's question, fantastic. Melanie. Uh, Ellen, let me go to you and get to your reaction. Okay, can you hear me? Gotcha. Um, I, I absolutely love your work. It's, um, I use a lot of color. And so I, I, this really draws me. And um, I grew up in Michigan and we vacationed in Ontario um, many, many times. And so there's a familiarity um, to your work for me. And it's just, um, it's inspirational. And, and I love, I was going to have the same question about the red um, canvases behind you. And I've learned as an artist that the color you paint over definitely does influence the final work. And I think that's a brilliant idea. I, I might even try that once myself. <laughs> <laughs> Your work and, is and just stunning. so you know, in the it's, background, it's really I see some stunning. nodding going on that we may have, have um, created some inspiration for, for a, a new uh, technique, a new approach. Yeah, and I, I find that um, the red is the one that worked for me. I tried yellow, hated it. I, um, I, I used to do a turquoise that used to work, but I just find that the red, um, because it's a complementary color, so you could choose any color that you want based on the color schemes that you tend to paint in if you do a complimentary background. Uh, Jim, thank you, Ellen. Jim, let me go to you. Hi, Jim. Oh, good morning. Um, yes, Jim Sopelsa, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, yeah, I was just curious, your, your sizes, are, you know, they're quite, uh, they're quite large, they're, you know, uh, five feet, six feet, eight feet. Uh, do you have a lot of, uh, of uh, commercial clientele? Uh, you know, public buildings, things like that. And I mean, it looks like it would lend itself well to, you know, public space. Uh, do you have a lot of, is that a, a, a direction you tend to go toward or is it yeah, all so nice question, Julia? Yeah. So I, I sell or I distribute my work through, through galleries, but I also sell direct. And what I find is interesting is there's, there's certain galleries that seem to have a clientele that is more um, towards um, industry. And, and buildings, and while there's other galleries that simply serve um, a residential clientele. So the ones that uh, seem to serve, uh, there's one that I have, I mean, in Waterloo, Ontario, and they're right in the middle of where Amazon is and all these big um, industries. And she sells my huge pieces in a heartbeat um, to medical facilities and offices for sure. Um, but I'm finding that the bigger I go, 
the more I'm selling to residential. Hmm. And it's very interesting because they're building cottages, they're building modern homes, and they want this, they have these big walls, and they want a huge piece versus a whole slew of little ones, which is why I said, my medium size, stick around. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, um, I, I, that that is a very interesting. It's a great question and very interesting commentary. And I think that um, th that sometimes, and and I'll try not to generalize too broadly, but I, I suspect that many artists have a little bit of a fear of working larger because of this idea that Jim mentioned. That well, if I don't have a connection to big business spaces and office spaces, my larger works won't fit into people's homes, and so they won't buy them. What that ignores is the fact that there are some large, large homes being built with um, tremendous spaces, um, you know, and, and the effect that Julia is creating is almost a uh, mural like painting. And there's a clientele for that. And because um, you don't see as many large works um, from artists or in galleries, if you're painting large, you have the potential to, to fill a niche that um, may not otherwise be filled, that there is, um, you, you know, you can find a, a competitive advantage there um, by being able to supply something that other artists aren't producing. So I encourage, um, mm -hmm. I mean, we sell a number of very large works as well um, and almost exclusively to private residences. And um, so it's, it, um, we do sell a lot of, of moderately sized and medium sized works as well, but I'm constantly encouraging the artists that I'm working with to, to think larger, to go larger. And, and as um, I, I get a lot of emails from my galleries saying they, they don't even ask me about my subject matter. They'll just say, got any 48 by 48s, any 48 by 60s. Like they just say, what have you got in these sizes? Yeah. Uh, so they're not even saying do you have trees or an island or an ocean. Big. They're just give going, us big. Give us big. Yeah. Well, excellent. Um, uh, let me go to Elizabeth first, and then I'll go to um, Ines. Hi, Julia. I love love your work. Um, just Same I'm thing. always drawn to color. I paint a lot of intense color landscapes as well. And a long time ago, when I first got back to my painting, I used uh, oranges as my background. And then recently somebody I saw was using hot pink and I tried that the other day and I thought, wow, that's really cool. I'm, I'm going to switch to hot pink for a little while, but that I had the same feeling. I can't do, I can't deal with the white. I need to co cover it up first and then, uh, and use that color in the background as part of my painting. Um, the questions I have here, I see that you've got all these multiple canvases ready to work on. Do you work on multiple canvases um, or do you do one at a time? And do you have an idea how long it takes you to, to complete a large painting? So, so without, you know, exposing myself too quickly, I always say that uh, paintings take sessions and sessions could be three hours, could be five hours, could be a day. The last session could be half an hour. Um, but the bigger the painting, the more sessions they take. But I tend to color block many paintings at the same time and use up a palette. I work in acrylic, so they so I, I, I like to be fresh and not get them muddy. So I tend to use um, a fresh palette and do many canvases. And then that canvas, that palette tends to get a little uh, muddy or thick because I don't use a medium. And so then again, I'm still, I'm trying to use up that palette because uh, my husband's Dutch and he's taught me how to be cheap. So I don't want to throw away the paint. So I try to try to color, you know, color block in as many canvases as I can with that palette. Then it's fresh palette day. And that's when those awesome um, touches go in the push and pull of a painting. But I have found that I can go live on Instagram and do my color blocking stage but I can't paint the final stages in front of anybody. It's not something, even if I was trying to do a, a time-lapse for my Instagram, I can't do it. I can't do the final. I, that has to be that pure interpretation without me worrying about who's seeing what I'm doing. So yes, I, I take, um, I work on many, a small one might take me, you know, an hour to color block. And then the next day, half an hour to do the final touches. 
Uh -huh. um, while a big one, I have to go over the whole painting again with those final touches. So that's hours and hours. Yeah, hours and hours. Yeah. Thanks so, so much. Cool. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, Ines, uh, let me ask you to unmute. There we go. Hi, thank you so much. I love your work. It's it's thank beautiful. You, so I do have a couple of questions. I, did, I didn't notice a signature, so I was wondering uh, where oh, it's fine. Maybe I just didn't see it. And then the other one, do you work off of your own photographs or how do, or what do you do? So I do sign it. I usually sign it at the bottom uh, right. I have quite a big signature, actually. Um, and I do work off most of my own photos. Um, most, I will ask friends if they are posting wonderful things, if I can use their photos. And then sometimes I go to um, a site where they have allowed people to use their photos for reference. But I always reinterpret and change things so that uh, it can't, it's not a reproduction of, of any, even if it's a free uh, image to use, I, I switch it up. So I use a lot of my own photos, take a million shots and, and print them out. Thank you. Excellent. You're welcome. Now I wanna switch gears just a little bit, Julia. Um, when you did the submission um, for the review, you would ask several questions. And so I'd like to, take those questions in turn and get the group's response to them and have a little conversation about each of those questions. And the first one is you asked, and it's a pretty simple one, am I too regional? <clears throat> now that too is doing a lot of work there. That's a, a re the real judgment call, right? Too regional. And so I'm curious how our group would respond to that question. Does the work feel too regional? Um, Gay, let me go to you. I got, I saw no, uh, several no's coming through in the chat, but uh, Gay, <laughs> um, what's your response? If I, if I hadn't known you were Canadian and I know nothing about the group of seven, except I just Googled them. And so I do now and Emily Carr, and now found who she is. But I say, <laughs> no, I mean, I wouldn't have said, oh, there's the Canadian of the group of seven. I mean, I, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but I don't think so. I think you're beautiful compositions. And your color work is fabulous. And that idiot who told you not to be so colorful in art school should be right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think that um, I think they're wonderful. They're evocative. And I think I want I want to tell you this, that I paint large and I had begun not to. And I thought I'll never sell my large ones ever again. And large to me is like you. It's 60 by 60, 72 by 80 or something like that. So you're inspiring me to carry on doing the large ones as well. But I'd say, no, I think your appeal and your artistry and your presentation are universal. Yeah. And I, I think to go along with that question, unless I ask this later and you're gonna put it up, I don't know, Jason, I might be jumping ahead. But I'll let you know. I, well, I was thinking, cause I'm not in any American galleries yet. And I, you know, Jason's gallery is in Arizona. And I was like, well, if, if I paint um, cacti, right. will, it, will it be authentic for me? I mean, I tend to have to experience, so I'd have to go to Arizona, wander for a while, take my own photos and, ex and experience. Like I didn't paint mountains for many years until I drove through the Canadian Rockies and, and experienced them. So I think that might be my question mostly there is how do I interpret if, if, if I was in a gallery in Arizona, how do I interpret what, what their needs are? Because they tend to, like, I have a gallery in Alberta and they just want my mountain paintings, right? They don't want a Muskoka, Ontario lake painting because it's a very different landscape. So I think that's what I'm asking. How can I be authentic yeah. and in a different region? It's a great question, and certainly we can't ignore the regionality. As you mentioned, some galleries are going to want um, very specific subject matter, but I, I'm curious, um, do we have those here in the group who've um, dealt with this kind of question in their own work, and how have you approached thinking about the regionality of your, your subject matter, um, and what, what advice would you give to Julie when it comes to branching out and experimenting with other subject matter? No one's experienced it. No, but Terry, let me go to you. Um, 
my landscapes are regional to where we are, Northern California, but um, my folk art is Inuit influenced and Alaskan influenced. And I had a real fear since I started in an Anchorage gallery that it wouldn't sell here and it actually is the work that sells the most. So I think introducing a fresh look for, you know, for people that live where we are, your work actually reminds me of some of our contemporary painters down here who are painting Tahoe, they're painting uh, Yosemite, they're, you know, a similar style, different subject. But and I'm familiar with the group of seven because they're my heroes. But <laughs> yeah, I think I think you don't need to worry about that. And my only thought is, I know when I was worried about it, I started with a gallery that was that I felt was a little closer to tolerating a more spiritual, iconic type of art. But then I just, I went into another gallery that is like upper class downtown and those works sell as well. So yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. Your work's wonderful. Yeah, other, other thoughts on region. Gay, let me go back to you. I, I'm gonna be real quick. And that is, if you paint what you want authentically, as well as you're doing what you're doing now, I personally don't believe it makes any difference because people actually latch on to the energy that's in the composition, even if it's a foreign view to them. I mean, I know I do. I get, I, oh, that's interesting, you know, but your joie de vivre, if I can put it like that, will capture their imagination. And I know some people don't go that way when they're looking at art, but I think the people that you, your persona uh, connects with will be fine. So then my question would be to Jason, um, but you wouldn't pull in a Muskoka, Ontario island. Wouldn't I then? That's a, Would it, it's, you not? It's, it, it's an interesting question. I've actually worked with a number of Canadian artists over the years. Now, some of them were more contemporary and abstracted, but um, I remember one artist in particular who also was, um, I would say, very influenced by the group of seven stylistically would, would, would fit into similar galleries that, that your work fits into. And um, you know, she was doing, she was from the, from Western Canada, but did a lot of, um, a variety of different Canadian subject matter. And um, I have sold her work in our Scottsdale gallery and in our Pine Top gallery. Um, and, and I would, would just echo what, what Gay was saying that, you know, ultimately, I think a lot of times, yes, certainly there are folks who are traveling to Arizona and they love the idea of um, buying a, a piece of artwork that reminds them of their travels here. And they love having a saguaro cactus. And, and sure, this is the place to come and buy that. But um, uh, it, it's, it's also interesting that there are a lot of buyers who maybe even thought that that was what was going to happen when they came to Arizona. But they walked into my gallery and they saw a beautiful mountain lake or um, pine trees, you know, that has nothing to do with Arizona. And it made a connection with them. And that was what we ended up shipping back to their home in Minnesota or mm -hmm. um, Florida or wherever it might have been. And, and so I would agree with, with this idea that um, really, um, as an artist, you have an opportunity to take your viewer on a journey and introduce them to new vistas and um, give them insights into the landscape. And, and the locale of that um, subject matter is in a lot of ways secondary um, or, or maybe not even important at all. It's the experience that, that they might be having. And so I don't spend a lot of time micromanaging um, what my artists, the artists that we represent, what they're doing. And um, we have, if you were to walk into our gallery right now, you would see a wide range of different subject matter. Now that would include some Southwest subject matter, obviously, because I have some artists who are here or who travel here and do that. Um, so I, I don't mind having that in the mix, but I'm not afraid to try other things as well. Now, having said all of that, what I might be a little bit careful about would be my titles. So, um, so often I've had a client come into the gallery and look at a painting and say, 
oh my goodness, I know right where this forest is. I've been in this exact spot and I've seen these birch trees where, you know, where I grew up in Maine. Well, I know that the artist who painted this, um, you know, got the subject matter in Colorado and they're Aspen, not birch. And, and, you know, but who am I to argue with a client when they have made such a deep connection with a piece of artwork? So maybe I wouldn't my, want my title to be, um, you know, Hamilton Lake or something like that, <laughs> that, where I'm instantly telling them that they're wrong. But the subject matter itself, um, you, you know, the landscape itself can speak across uh, to a variety of different interests and, and locales and, and really it's your artistry that, that uh, I think is, is what's most important. And so I, having, you know, we've only seen a small sampling of your work, but I wouldn't hesitate to um, present your portfolio of current works to galleries south of the border and um, to, to start to give galleries an opportunity to respond to that work. Well, thank you. Uh, Jim, it looks like you had a comment as well on that, that uh, subject matter. Uh, let me get you unmuted there. There we go. Yeah, the question I had for Julia is, um, have you tried to uh, go into another uh, you know, type of uh, landscape or something? The reason I asked that is, your your um, familiarity with the things that you're painting now uh, really come through. I mean, they, they're very warm. They're very you know, there's a depth there that uh, you can see that this is a a place that you're familiar with that you have you're comfortable with. Uh, if you start, and I guess you just have to try it. Uh, you know, painting a desert scene or whatever. Uh, your experience may help if you're going to do that to like get out there and live it you know i mean rather than just doing an illustration of a picture from a magazine you know i mean it, it, mm -hmm. it, i don't know if you're following me on this but yeah, <laughs> i guess no, you need I, to try i guess you need to try it is all I'm i i do need to experience mm -hmm. the place i i've not been successful you know just interpreting imagery um you know like uh when i paint africa i know what it feels like and smells like and uh, you know, how the light hits. And what's interesting is when I paint the West coast versus Ontario, a, a different palette comes out because in Ontario, we have a many, many deciduous trees that turn color and the West seems to have mostly evergreen. And so there's a very different palette that happens. And I've been to, you know, California and just been so, inspired and I've been to Arizona and driven through you know some of the the landscapes there and been so inspired and um yeah it's just that I will have so many people the first time I drove through the Canadian Rockies and then I painted and then I painted it I had people saying where is this mountain I'm like I don't have a clue where this mountain yeah. is it's, I started in Calgary I ended up in Kelowna like I didn't know I was supposed to track you know, yeah, and GPS people, coordinates. yeah. And people ask, have you painted, like, I'll get a, I'll get an email. Have you painted Wally's Creek in BC? I don't know. <laughs> did I pass Wally's Creek and take a picture of it? Maybe I did. And um, so that I find really interesting. And every gallery seems to sell different, like my work, I believe, has my thumbprint across the whole thing so if i did a palm tree painting you would still know it was mine um but i wouldn't sell a palm tree painting in a, a cottage country gallery they wouldn't want it they wouldn't curate it in so that yeah, would have and, to be and, and so i i would echo a little bit what jim's saying and that there's some room for experimentation of course the flip side of that and the challenge is that um you know as you experiment and expand your subject matter it's always going to be at the cost of the subject matter you have been pursuing, right? If, if I'm painting mm -hmm. a, a desert scene, that's, that's taking away from the time that, that you'd have available to do Rocky Mountain landscapes or, or um, you know, Ontario landscapes. And, and so that has to become a question too, is how do you balance that, um, especially if you're in a situation where your work is selling well, how do you justify um, taking the time away from that? And, mm -hmm. and so I think that does come back to my suggestion to artists is 
you better follow your passion and be spending your time in ways that excite you and keeps you interested and invigorated. And if that includes experimentation and travel and doing different subject matter, then go for it. And if it doesn't, don't feel guilty about it. Um, you know, go where, where your heart and, and interest um, is taking you. And we are quickly running out of time, Julie. I did want to get to one other question that you asked, and that was, when is it time to raise prices? Julia, um, well, I, I guess the first thing I'd say is if you're asking that question, it probably almost is time. Um, but, but talk about that a little bit. Um, what have the challenges been when it's come to pricing your work? We saw some, some price points. Um, and um, uh, do, do you struggle a little bit with this question of, of raising prices? So I just, ra I, I'm trying to remember when I even submitted to you, but it seems like I did do the, pr the present price uh, points are, are on there. So I just did a price uh, increase of 10%. I hadn't raised my prices for a few years and um, I was a little bit worried. So that's probably was when I wrote, yeah. you know, when I applied, I was probably like, Whoa, oh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm increasing my prices. Is it time? But since then, what I have found is I still, I'm still selling everything. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's fine. So I, my journey through through selling has been like those little 12 by 12s up there um, sell for about 700 Canadian. I remember about 10 years ago, they were $50 <laughs> and I sold so many, I had to double it and then double it again and double it and get it to a point where I could paint them and they weren't selling out so fast that I was comfortable. You know, it yes. was, it, I wasn't exhausted. So um, I'm slowly raising my, my price point. Um, and you also have to get your point price to the point where when, if you sell it through a gallery, you're getting 50% that you're happy with the 50%. And so that's always yeah. the thing that I have. So I think when I asked the question, I was doing that jump, um, but now have proven to myself that it was fine. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and I, you know, um, so often, especially, you know, if you are showing in galleries and you've got a steady level of sales going, um, the right answer to that question is that it's almost always time to raise prices, but at least, at least once a year, we should be stopping and saying, you know, is it, is it time 10%? The artists that I'm working with um, on average are raising their prices somewhere between seven and 12% per year. Um, you know, so just regularly, there's this march of, of increasing value in the work. Now, sometimes that'll slow down a little bit when, it feels like the economy is a little rocky, but um, even then, um, and certainly over these last few years of, of um, shall we call it uh, uh, turmoil, um, to put it mildly, um, we, we've seen that artists who have raised their prices have continued to sell well. So um, it, it's classic economic theory that when the demand is there and you're having a hard time um, supplying the work, keeping up with that demand, that the, the mm -hmm. right answer is to um, increase the value of the work. However, where that classic economic theory breaks down is that what you're describing and what a lot of artists <laughs> find is that when they do increase the value, the demand can actually increase in lockstep with that. Um, and, and so I, you know, obviously we don't want to run out and throw a zero on our price and, and, and hope for the best, but a steady, um, consistent uh, march toward higher values is, is often called for, and especially as, as you're selling well. And so, Julia, um, we, there's so much more we could talk about, but it's, it's been a real pleasure um, having the opportunity to look at your work and hear about your background and your experience. Thank you so much for uh, joining us here in the online critique group. Well, this was a real pleasure and really so much fun. And I wish I could connect with all of you. It was yes. just, it's great. Well, um, we're here every week, so okay. it's a great opportunity to connect there. And um, Julia, if um, the artists here want to connect with you, what's the best way to keep up with you? Is it Instagram, Facebook, your website? So Instagram is great. Um, Jay Veenstra Artist at Instagram. Um, my website, you can sign up for my newsletter and you'll certainly get that. Um, yeah. So the, awesome. I, I love to answer emails and I chat a lot on Instagram and I do a lot of um, promotional and educational art reels there. I'm trying to take over TikTok, but it's a little slower. That, 
<laughs> right. We're, we're, we all feel a little too old for that, but, um, but we're giving it a go. Excellent. Well, Julia, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for joining us for this week's session. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Take care, everyone. Be well. Thanks, guys.